paper like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers. I say, that's the bad guy. That's the bad guy. Okay, we'll start with this. This weekend on the undercard of Jordan Gill versus Zelfa Barrett, we're going to be seeing unbeaten up-and-comer Rhiannon Dixon vie to become the lightweight division's newly crowned lightweight champion opposite the ring tough Argentinian slugger Karen Carbajal. She's tough. 33 years old to young Rhiannon, who's a very fresh and fly 28. Karen is an orthodox fighter, whereas Rhiannon Dixon, she's a southpaw sporting a professional record of nine wins with no losses, no draws, one knockout. To Karen Carbajal, who is noticeably more experienced with a lot more rounds in the bank, sporting a professional record of 22 wins with one loss, just one loss, no draws, three knockouts, having never been knocked out in 22 professional bouts and that one loss there's no shame in it she lost to katie taylor it's the only fighter that's beat her so far and in that fight karen carbajal she made katie taylor work for it i have the sneaking suspicion she's gonna make Rhiannon dixon work for it this weekend i'm gonna say that karen carbajal is not as polished as Rhiannon dixon in spite of having more professional experience more rounds in the bank than her she's not necessarily as polished a boxer, as refined, not as neat and tidy, but still very dangerous, the way that Argentinian fighters often are, like we saw this past weekend with Gustavo Limos and Richardson Hitchens. The way these come forward sluggers and aggressive fighters can take an otherwise polished boxer out of their comfort zone. That's the situation this weekend. Kind of fighter that Rhiannon will be facing, Karen Carbajal. She saw action earlier this year back in February and two times last year, so she ain't got no ring rust to shake off. Neither does Rhiannon. Rhiannon Dixon has seen action in the last 12 months, last in action in September of last year. Before that, she fought in March of last year. She fought two times last year. This will be her first fight. Of this one and what is a genuine acid test it is not a foregone conclusion that Rhiannon Dixon wins this fight I think this will be her toughest assignment her toughest assignment to date her toughest assignment so far Rhiannon Dixon is best described as a fast and athletic fighter a speedster and that's what she's got to use to win this weekend because that's what she's got on Karen Carbajal she is noticeably faster she's a noticeably faster and sharper puncher than Karen Carbajal Karen who looks to be a little bit taller and a little bit longer than Rhiannon Dixon but noticeably slower punches wider very aggressive strong and game still noticeably slower punches wider giving Rhiannon Dixon if she's sharp the opportunity to catch her in between this is not the kind of opponent you have to track down this is not the kind of opponent you have to go out there and find Karen Carbajal will find you thus the assignment for Rhiannon Dixon isn't necessarily to fight fire with fire, but use her speed to work around it. Slip and counter, catch and counter. Keep those hands high. Guard tight. That's how to do it. Punch for punch. I think that Karen might be a little bit stronger than Rhiannon Dixon. That's what all that professional experience has given her. Toughness and know-how. Though she's not a finesse fighter, her experience that she has a lot more fights than Rhiannon and a lot more rounds in the bank manifests in her stubbornness, her persistence when she She's coming forward, stepping into the jab and putting punches together, trying to overwhelm her opponent with activity. Unafraid to take one in order to give one. Give two if she can, if you're still standing there. It's where Rhiannon Dixon's speed and athleticism comes in. She's got to use that to work around the aggression of Karen Carbajal. Slip and counter, catch and counter, move your head, move your torso. You'll notice Rhiannon Dixon is a very herky-jerky fighter. Fast and fidgety. One slip, one. Slip it. One, two, Slip to. Slip it. Because Karen's going to come in, trying to bust through the front door, throwing punches in bunches. So slipping. It's the first order of the day. Whether Rhiannon Dixon is initiating an exchange or is on the receiving end of one, reacting to one. Slip it. Slip and counter. Slip and roll. Where Rhiannon Dixon's speed 
will service her best is that she is a more compact fighter, very tight in the pocket, where Karen Carbajal, she's got those long arms, those long levers, while being noticeably slower than Rhiannon Dixon. That's her out. Rhiannon can get inside of those long arms from Karen Carbajal, put two and three punches together, then roll out. Move! It's a sensational fight, what I think promises to be a fan-friendly fight, because they both like to flurry, they both like to fight, they both like to trade, but Rhiannon's punches are shorter, sharper, faster. Even though it's not a foregone conclusion that Rhiannon wins this fight, I am back her to win a points decision because of who trains her and the work that they've done so far with Anthony Crolla in her corner. He's done a fantastic job of molding this young fighter to a crafty southpaw, a crafty mid-range to inside speedster combination puncher counter puncher. The time is right. This fight heralds at 135 pounds is the changing of the guard, the old guard to the new guard. What they're fighting for is Katie Taylor's old WBO title. Katie's vacated two of what were her four titles at this weight. Looks like she's going to proceed at 140 pounds moving forward. Winner of this fight, I anticipate, will be Rhiannon Dixon by way of a points decision. will usher in a new era of lightweight champions. It's not going to be easy. But I'm going with Rhiannon Dixon. I'm going with Rhiannon Dixon to win a points decision this Saturday on the undercard of Jordan Gill versus Zelfa Barrett. So this is a 50-50 fight down the line. It's split even. I mean, Israel Majorov, he's little Triple G. I came on this show. I'm consistent. I said he might be the best in the division other than Bud. I said that not too long ago. And I fully believe it. You know, he's little Triple G comes out that double camp. And the way they train is just, it's different. It's real different. And the thing with little Triple G is they trained him to be like Triple G, but a better version. He has more skills. He's more athletic. The only thing he might not have is the chin, but he still has a good chin. That's not even a knock. So, I think this is a 50 50 fight for a lot of factors. You know, Bud got to go to Saudi. He's never been over there. Well, Israel Maduro well, just fought well, here. Well, the report is that this is a U.S. invasion. So it would I don't be. Believe that. I mean, hey. I don't believe that. You know, this is ESPN yeah. knockout reporting. When so. they say invasion, I feel like that man getting Bud since he's that married. I have to agree with the caller. Crawford versus Israel Madrimov. If they can make it and the reports ring true and it happens in either Saudi or Los Angeles, it's an excellent fight. Israel Madrimov is an excellent fighter. Now a newly crowned junior middleweight champion, a fight between him and Terrence Crawford. It's great. Even though some people don't like it. The usual suspects, the guys who are usually trying to tear Terrence Crawford down not but a week or so ago, they were about to celebrate because it looked a lot like Terrence Crawford was going to be frozen out of the world title picture at 154 pounds. And in come these reports that Saudi is interested in Crawford and staging a fight between him and Israel. Yeah. Now they want to tear down Israel. Well, I'm 100% sure they don't even watch. The situation, we know that as a result of the injuries that Sebastian sustained in the Tim Zoo fight, he may be on the shelf until late September when he will be cleared to train again. So Crawford can't fight him. And he will bring up the name of Jaron Boots Ennis in this situation, saying that now is the perfect time to make that fight. But my question remains the same. Who's going to pay for it? Has an offer been made to Terrence Crawford on Jaron Ennis's behalf by anyone? Somebody has to pay for the fight. Put the money up. Before me and you even mull over whether or not we're going to buy it, somebody has to pay to make it. And to my knowledge, no one has offered Terrence Crawford any money to fight Jaron Boots Ennis. If anything, it's the opposite. Well, over a year ago, it was Black Prime trying to make that fight on behalf of Crawford to Ennis. And Team Ennis turned it down. Don't. I don't want to repeat myself because we've been all through that. Jaron Ennis' opportunity to fight Terrence Crawford came and went. Here and now, if he's serious and he really wants to fight him, has anyone made Crawford an offer? Because Terrence is a network and promotional free agent. There's nobody on his side who can pay for the fight. So it's got to be somebody on Ennis's side. Most speculate that Jaron Ennis may go into bed with the PBC, and if he does, they would be the ones that have to make the offer. They would have to be the ones that pay for the fight. And to my knowledge, they haven't offered to do that. I am so sick of talking about that. Because the Madrimov fight is a great fight with a great young fighter, unbeaten, who's a champion, at a higher weight 
that affords Terence the chance to become a four division champion instead of just fighting for a belt that he already had. This fight would be at a new weight for a belt that he doesn't have. Though as usual, there's always a group of people that want to poo poo all over everything Terence Crawford does. What they don't like about him, he's not one of Al Heyman's slaves. What they don't like about Terence is that he's a maverick and he marches to the beat of his own drum. Top Rank did not have their thumb on this fighter any more than the PBC had their thumb on this fighter. What they don't like. You can't keep him down. After he parted ways quite unamicably with Top Rank, he was a network and promotional free agent trying to negotiate the Spence fight. And when all of that fell apart, not last year, the year before that, he managed to schedule himself a keep busy fight, a maintenance fight in late 2022 with David Avenesian. And if you can believe this, people actually criticized him for it, criticized him for keeping busy. Though if the guy wasn't going to fight Spence, what was he supposed to do? Sit on the shelf collecting dust like Spence did? You see how well that worked out for him. How it worked out. Big bad Spence, who's got big bad fucking Al Heyman in his corner, couldn't get that guy a maintenance fight, but Terrence managed to. And you're mad at him? In 2022, when the talks between them fell apart, Terrence managed to get himself a maintenance fight to keep busy and keep the tools sharp, and Spence didn't, even though Spence was the one with the major promotional outfit behind him. And for that, you get mad at Terrence. He's a maverick. They didn't like him before he fought Errol Spence Jr. They like him even less afterwards because he kicked his fucking ass he's a maverick and where a little over a week ago they thought that they would be able to freeze him out of the world title picture at 154 pounds here comes this news that he may be facing newly crowned wba junior middleweight champion is rael madrimov and now they want to poo poo all over that he's a maverick they're angry about is that Terence won't kiss the rings, the proverbial rings. He won't bow down to Al Heyman or his PBC. He's not one of their slaves. And try as they might, they can't keep him down. He's a maverick. They can't keep him out, but they were gonna try. It's not a coincidence that Errol Spence Jr. was ringside for Zoo versus Fundora. I don't think it's a coincidence that Sebastian, quite conveniently, is gonna be on the shelf for most of this year. Even though he owes Terence a title shot. I don't think it's a coincidence that now he's quote unquote unavailable to do that. It's not. It was looking a lot like they were gonna freeze Terrence out, have Sebastian fight Errol instead, and these guys were celebrating. I saw them. Chastising Terrence Crawford for not kissing the rings. What was he supposed to do? Lose to Errol Spence Jr. to make you feel better? Is that it? You're blaming him? For the rematch having not happened, that's on Errol. If Errol really wanted that rematch, he had the chance to pursue it. He chose not to, because he doesn't want to get his ass kicked again. And you don't want him to get his ass kicked again either. What you want is for Terrence Crawford to fall in line with all those hapless PBC scrubs. Bow to Al Heyman and kiss the rings and all that other fantasy bullshit. Fuck out of here. They don't like about Terrence Crawford is that he's a maverick who marches to the beat of his own drum and try as they might to keep him down. He's resourceful because here comes this news that he may be facing is Rael Madrimov with the Saudis blessing, the Saudis backing, whether it's in Saudi or Los Angeles, wherever it lands. And it's a good fight. If they're the ones paying for it, you know it's for good money. And that's what the reports indicate. What they don't like about Terrence is he won't bow down to Al Heyman. The why would he? Al Heyman is the reason the Spence fight took so long to make. Those are not his friends. Post-fight, when he said that they tried to freeze him out, who do you think he was talking about? Do you think he's supposed to kiss their ass? Looking forward to Crawford versus Madrimov, if they make it and the reports ring true, further proving that you can't keep a good man down. Down! Upstairs at heavyweight, ahead of what is to be the Fury versus Usyk fight, Oleksandr Usyk has said he accepted Anthony Joshua's apology for his post-fight interview after their rematch. He said, yes, definitely. Listen, I have no bad feelings about Joshua because I respect this man. He's a great man. He's a great boxer, Olympic champion, two-time world champion. I think it's emotion. No problem, Anthony. I remember immediately after that, 
A lot of people chose to give Anthony a hard time the way they always choose to give him a hard time. But Usyk didn't. And that says a lot about Usyk as he was the party that was so affected by it. It says a lot about his character. Oleksandr Usyk has said he is expecting a different Tyson Fury. Different? A different Tyson Fury in their fight to the one that fought Francis Ngannou. Listen, Fury will be different with me. I think Fury, when boxing with Ngannou, it's a UFC guy, blah blah blah, or I win, it's an easy fight, blah blah blah. Maybe it's true, maybe not, but I know Fury will be different with me, and we're already seeing the signs of that as Tyson Fury uploads training videos where he appears to be wearing a fat suit. Modeling a very different physique to the one that he modeled in the Nganu fight. The blubbering mass that he was going into the Nganu fight where he's trying very hard to get down in weight, fit and trim ahead of this one. What the fuck is a heavyweight wearing a fat suit for? It's not like he's got to make a specific weight. There's no weight limit at heavyweight, and yet Tyson Fury is making a conscious effort to shed the pounds because of what I told you before. He wants to box up Oleksandr Yusik. He wants to use his height and his length to make the smaller man come to him. Walk him into punches. Set traps. Until this point, most people's evaluation of the match is that Tyson Fury would be too big and too strong for Usyk and that he would mow him down Don't. the way he mowed Deontay Wilder down. That doesn't appear to be the case. He put on weight for the Wilder fight where he's shedding weight for this one. Because he wants to move and punch. Validating Usyk's own assertion that however Tyson Fury was with Francis Ngannou, that's not how he's going to be with him. That He's going to be different, and that's what he's preparing for. That mental edge, preparing for the best version of the fighter, in case that's the one that shows up. It's the best way to go about it, not building the strategy around the fighter's weaknesses, but the fighter's strengths. So if a very good version of that fighter shows up, you're ready. You've been preparing for that. And if a not-so-good version of him shows up, even better. And the power of silence, not being boisterous or talkative, not saying this and that about how Fury looked in the Nganu fight, how he looked here, what happened there. Usyk doesn't do it. Whether or not it's deliberate is open to interpretation, but I do believe it has an effect on his enemy's psyche and his enemy's mind. The image of Usyk, the idea of him, is growing because he's not giving you anything to bounce off of. You're going off your own imagination. Because he's not saying much, much about anything. He's not saying much about you. He's not talking you down. He doesn't have to. Which can be interpreted as a visceral kind of confidence that he has. I don't have to trash the guy. I'm going to beat him. I know I'm going to beat him and I don't need to fill the air. Sound bites. When the time comes, I'll do what I need to do. It's the power of silence, the power of reserve. Control. That you can tear the guy down the same way he tears you down. You're well within your rights, but you don't have to. And not tearing him down may have more of an effect on him than if you did. He's preparing for the best version of Tyson Fury. Whether or not the best version of Tyson Fury shows up has yet to be determined, but I said it before and I'll say it again. The best version of Fury? You can conjure up the best version of Tyson Fury. He's still not a better boxer than this guy. Fury looks like he's planning on boxing him, so go ahead.